chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 3, and we're going to talk about fellowshipping in the mystery, and fellowshipping in the mysteries, if you'll notice I made it plural, in the mysteries of God, both the kingdom of heaven and the body of Christ are associated, have mysteries associated with them. And uh, as, it, as uh, Willard's pointing out here, all of these messages that we're going to have over at that conference are all about the various mysteries that make up what we call the revelation of the mystery. So the mystery itself is like the umbrella, and, uh, and the mysteries of the mystery, which are the sub-chapter, small subjects having to do with individual distinct things, uh, are what makes it up. So we're going to look at that over at the conference. We're going to talk about the fellowship that we have in those things right now. Uh, last week we talked about uh, a little bit about this, and we're going to continue on with it this week. So I'd like to kind of maybe finish this up. And before we do that, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, and we thank you for uh, the position that we have in your family as members of the body of Christ. We thank you for the fellowship that we have as members of the body of Christ. And, Lord, we thank you that we, we are here today uh, not only joined to one another as fellow members of the body of Christ, but, but we're joined to you, the head. We thank you for that today. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Ephesians chapter 3. Uh, the mystery is revealed in distinct parts. It's not just one big revelation. It's, it's a revelation that took place over time, and there are various issues. There are various distinct issues issues in the whole makeup of the mystery of God and what we call the gospel of the grace of God and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. In Ephesians, uh, you'll notice on the chart in the book of Ephesians, the issue is what? The church. The formation of the church, the body of Christ. God's doing something today that's never been done before. He's not finished doing it today. He, he's still doing it. It's been taken almost, uh, two, almost 2,000 years now, and God is forming a new family. He's forming two families, but they're going to be one family in eternity. Uh, right now, he's forming the nation uh, of Israel over here on this end of the chart, and then today, in this dispensation of grace, he's forming the church, the body of Christ. These are distinct, different entities. They're not the same thing. Uh, they will be joined together in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10. He says that he's going to bring them all back together. And then heaven and earth are going to be put back together as well. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. After the kingdom is over, all this stuff is going to be joined back together. And we're going to have uh, basically all of God's family in one place at one time doing what we're supposed to do. And I, I'm going to tell you, this is exciting stuff because these are things that we think about a lot by ourselves but don't always get a chance to easily or readily discuss with others. People don't uh, always kind of think about these things the same way you and I might because they're not, they're not with us on where the, what's happening with this chart and how these things work. The dispensation of the grace of God is a fantastic thing. And, and what, what's so great about it is it is our mandate. It is our grace commission. I remember... When I was learning about the commissions, my pastor taught me, well, Matthew chapter 10 is the Great Commission. I heard the Great Commission was in Matthew 28. So, well, no, that's not the Great Commission. Fundamentalists call Matthew 28, 19 and 20, go ye unto all the world and preach the gospel. They call that the Great Commission. He explained to me, he said, Russ, no, that's not the Great Commission. That's the Greater Commission. The Great Commission was when Jesus sent the 12 out in Matthew 10, Luke chapter 9. He sent a small group of men out to reach his nation. That's the Great Commission. That's the first Great Commission. Then in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, when he gets ready to ascend, what happens is he, on the Mount of Olives, he gives them this information and he says, Go ye unto all the world. All authority has been given unto me. And the church has been trying to labor under that so-called Great Commission, which is the greater commission than the first one. The first one failed, by the way. And now the church, the body of Christ, has taken upon itself, or, or professing, the professing church, Christendom, has taken upon itself to try to, to preach that message that was given to the, the 11 apostles over there and, and make that part of the commission today that we have. Well, that's a big mistake because that makes it a failure. 
There is no gospel message in that commission for any Jew. And the reason for that is that he's giving the message and the commission to the Jews. He's given it to the 11. And he's, he, that's where the commission is. It's to them. And so if you read that, you say, well, how does a Jew get saved under this commission? They don't. When that commission goes forth, it's going to go forth in the, in the tribulation and in the kingdom over here. And it won't have to lead anybody to Christ in, in Judaism. They'll already be saved. And it says, the word of God says that they've, they'll all know him from the least to the greatest in Israel. Israel doesn't get saved in the kingdom. Israel gets saved before the kingdom starts. She gets saved at the second coming of Jesus Christ. And she gets saved out of the great tribulation. And then they're ready at that point to go out to the nations and preach the Lord Jesus Christ and his message of grace and to preach all those things about who he is and what they're going to have to do. And they're going to go out and they're going to do that. That's who is going to do that in the kingdom. So that's the greater commission. The greatest commission, the third one, Great, greater, greatest. The, the greatest one is the one we have right here. You know why it's so great? You know why it's greater than all the others? Because it's ours. It belongs to us. You can be happy about theirs if you want. It's okay. I'm happy that those guys went out there and they, they went out and did what they did. And I'm happy that they're going to go out and do it over here. But, you know, that really doesn't pertain to me specifically and, and, and directly, does it? The greatest commission, in my view, and the greatest commission that I can understand is the one God gave to me, right here. And that's the gospel of the grace of God. That's, that's the gospel of the grace of God that takes people that are absolutely in desperation, seeking God and looking for a way to keep from going to the lake of fire. They get put into the body of Christ. We watched a young lady very patiently sit through three hours of talking Thursday afternoon. Scott brought a lady over Thursday afternoon to the shop, and we had a Bible study, and uh, three hours later, <laughs> she was still listening. Well, hey, you got to find out what their endurance level is if you're going to talk to them. Uh, you know, you can, you can handle a two-hour movie. You can handle me for another extra hour. Especially when it's about things of life and death, okay? And when it's talking about things concerning going to the lake of fire and not going to the lake of fire, I would spend 12 hours trying to learn that if I had to. So that's a pretty important subject. And uh, after we had a little time with her in the, initially in the beginning, uh, it was clear that she wasn't sure what the gospel was. And uh, she could not give us the gospel clearly, and she didn't know. Uh, I think she had uh, an idea in her mind, and uh, so I made her write that idea down, and sure enough, it was true. It was a, it was a bad idea, okay? <laughs> you don't try to sell yourself to God. You do not try to say, hey, I've been this. I've done this. That's not going to cut it with God. God's going to look at you and he's going to say, yeah, but I did this. What did you do with that? And so by the end of the session we had, it was clear to her she needed a Savior. And once you start seeing that need for a Savior, you're on your way. Now, she's had a few days to mull it over. I'm sure she's still thinking about it. And I hope Allison got saved. I really do. Because you know what? You're not guaranteed a single day. You, you have no guarantee of tomorrow. I was talking to an old friend of mine. And we were talking about a, a, a neighbor boy of ours that passed away here recently a few weeks ago. And uh, we, we grew up with him. And another one of the boys in the neighborhood that I knew, uh, he just passed away. They walking out to the mailbox and just dropped dead on the way out there. You know, boom. And this guy was certifiably crazy. I mean, I know that, okay? <laughs> but in, in a rambunctious kind of way. 
he was not interested in the Lord or religion, and he was never interested in any of those things. He thought that was in, insane and uh, incredibly stupid. But I'm going to tell you, uh, I still, when I heard the news yesterday that he had passed away, I thought about it. I said, you know, that's just too bad. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? I can't do anything about it. What, what, what's, what's more sad about this than anything else is that God himself can't do anything about it either. Because he's already done everything he could ever do for the man. What do you do? Dickie Betts wrote that song. He says, there ain't nothing you can do when you love somebody and they don't love you. There's just nothing you can do. When you get rejected and you love somebody so much that you would do everything in your power to make sure they get eternal life, and believe me, this was not a half-baked, secondary, low-level attempt. This was God giving everything he had, everything. The most valuable price ever paid for anything was paid right there. And I think what's interesting is that the greatest secret ever kept secret is now what is revealing. It's, it's what we read in the mystery of God that's now revealing this. The sad thing is the mystery is still a mystery. Des, were, Des was talking about his message for the upcoming conference, the mystery of godliness. I said, yeah, the mystery of godliness is still a mystery to the church, the body of Christ, because they got no idea what godliness is. The mystery of godliness is Jesus Christ living his life through you, through the grace of God, and letting him shine out through you. I mean, haven't they ever listened to that song, Let Your Little Light Shine? What is wrong with these folks? But yet... They continue on a path of works, works, works. Well, the mystery is still a mystery for most people. But I'm going to tell you, within this mystery, there are some things that you and I share that we need to remind ourselves of because they're important to our security, not eternally, but to our security as a group. We act as one, we operate as one, we think as one, we enjoy each other's fellowship, and we protect each other in this. This is very important. You know, this is a safe place for you when it comes to spiritual matters. You go out into the world and you find yourself at a Catholic funeral like uh, uh, you just did there, and I, I'm thinking about that. It's like, you know, <laughs> that scares me. I went to one of those at St. Jude's, and uh, I was invited to go down there, and I, I, I went down there with a friend of mine, and we didn't go to the funeral. We just went down there to, to do something at the church to pick up something, and I was there, and we went into the balcony, and they happened to be having a funeral at the time, and I said, let's stay here and watch this. We were up in the balcony, and I stayed and watched this funeral, and I can't tell you how happy I was when I walked out of that building rejoicing in who I am. I mean, it, it, just, it just set me ablaze of that uh, with Thanksgiving because I, I was just like, wow. I've been talking recently with some folks about these kind of things. We were talking about somebody the other day, and we were dealing with this issue of he lost his dad and everything, and I was talking to him. I, and I, it, it got me to start thinking about mortality a little bit. And uh, when you think about mortality, you know, others, and, and of course your own, you have a tendency to to not want to believe it. You know, you're like, well, I've been alive all this time. This is just going to, you know, I'm never going to die. <laughs> I made the statement a few weeks ago, I'm not really going to die. I'm just going to transition, you know. Well, that's really what we're going to do. To be absent from the body is present with the Lord. I don't think there's any time in between that. I think it's pretty quick. Some people say that there is a lot of time, and you go to sleep, and you wake up there. I don't, I don't believe any of that stuff. I believe that when you're absent from the body, you are present with the Lord Jesus Christ instantly, instantaneously. You're there being welcomed to glory. There are some things that we believe about what we're supposed to be doing in this life, 
and going out and telling others about this escape from death, this, this wonderful new way to, to get around it. Paul says he's brought immortality and life to light. He's putting it under the, sh the, the spotlight and shedding the light on it. He's, he's brought everlasting life right up to us so we can see it. Put it under the light and look at it. He's brought immortality and life to light through the gospel. And our ambassadorship, our mission in life, our grace commission demands that we go out with some sort of local authority, with some sort of home base, with some sort of group around us that supports us so that when we start thinking weird things and doing wrong things and, and, and being unsure of ourselves and getting depressed and, and not knowing what to do and walking in circles and going around and around and around and start trying to figure out what's going on in my life, there needs to be some stability. That stability is here, right here in this local assembly. And I want to tell you, I, I, I've, I've been involved with local churches for quite a long time now. I, I, I helped start a church back in uh, the day when Carl and I first met in the late 70s. And I watched the things that went on in that church, and I've watched the things that have gone on in many, many other churches here in Florida and around the country, and watched the trouble and the problems and all the issues that go on. And we went through some pretty rough stuff here like that, 1996, 1997. I mean, it, it's, we're not immune to those things. But, you know, in all these things, I learned one very important thing. No matter what happens, after the smoke clears and you get a real clear view of what's going on, you're reading the verses, grace always wins. Always. And when we get to glory, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to say grace always wins wins. And there's going to be billions and billions of people in the lake of fire going, yeah, you're right. I just wish I was a part of that. You know, there are these things that we need to consider. And uh, one of them is, turn over to Ephesians chapter 4. One of them is the seven unities of the Holy Spirit. Seven unities. I'm not going to teach all of them right now because we don't have the time. I'm just going to give you, I'm going to give you these five things I want to talk about. We're just going to go through them kind of lightly, but we'll touch more of them on them later. But Ephesians chapter 4, Paul says, in, he, he goes into the verse, uh, in verse 3, he leads into it by saying, endeavoring to keep the unity. This, it takes work. It's an endeavor. He says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, and one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. I love that. We're in habitation of God through the Spirit. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 22. You're a temple, fitly framed together, he says. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. Fitly framed together into a holy temple in the Lord. Look at verse 22. In whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. The Spirit of God allows the Godhead to dwell in you. I told Allison Thursday, I said, somewhere between the top of your head and the bottom of your feet, God dwells in you. And her eyes just got real big going, really? Well, if you're saved, he does. And once he comes in and lives in you, there's nobody going to kick him out, okay? You're in. You're sealed. And there's unity in this. These seven unities are very, very important, and they're to be kept intact in the local church. There is one body of Christ. There is not a nation trying to come out of apostasy so they can set up a kingdom. That's not what's going on today. God is filling up the body of Christ. That's his mission today. It's our mission. There is only one hope of this in particular calling, and it is the hope of Jesus Christ in you, and that is the hope of glory, Colossians 1 says. Christ in you, your only hope of glory. 
That's why it's a blessed hope. And that's why we're in Titus 2.13 exhorted to look for that blessed hope every single day. Because we have no idea when the last person in the body of Christ is going to get put in. And when the last person goes in, we're going out. I don't know when that's going to happen. And for me, it's not that big of a deal, honestly. I, I enjoy the blessed hope like everybody else. And I, I want to I tell you that I, I look for that thing every day. That's one of the things that, that, that me and my toothbrush have in common. We're both thinking about the Lord coming today. When I get up in the morning, I always tell myself, today's the day. I might get to come home from work tonight, and I might not. I might not even make it to the driveway this morning. Who knows? How fast do you think it's going to be? How fast is a moment in the twinkling of an eye? Well, it's inside of a 60-second moment, and the twinkling of an eye is as fast as the speed of light. So if it's that quick, here today, gone today. <laughs> here today, gone forever. And you kind of envision yourself, you know, going up there, and you think, that's going to be amazing. You think you'll be scared? There won't be a scared bone in your body. There won't be a bone in your body, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Not like the ones you got now, the brittle ones that break. You're going to have a brand new body. And you're going to enjoy that. And when you get that, you're going to say, whoa, man, this is, this is uh, planet what? Where, where am I from again? You won't remember any of this in a bad way. Anything you remember here will all be good won't have any bad memories. The only thing you're going to have to deal with is trying to figure out how to operate in the new body, which I think will be self-explanatory. And then the next thing you're going to have to deal with is your Savior, the boss, who you've been working for all your life, okay, since you've been saved. And he's got some things he wants to discuss with you, and it has to do with your service. And so while we're here, we don't dwell on the vacation aspect of it. We, we dwell on the work aspect of it. But we're all looking forward to the time off, aren't we? It's good to have a time off. It's good to have some refreshing time off. It's good to rest. It's good for that. That's what it's going to be for us. We're going to go up there. We're going to be in the heavenly places. But we're going to have a vocation up there as well. Now, the fact that we'll probably, each of us have several hundred million angels to take care of those things, whatever. I don't know how many I'll have or you'll have or whatever, but God's going to give us the angels that we need to help take care of all the business we take care of. We're going to be purely administrative, and we're going to be getting these things done, and we're going to be watching over and taking care of the administration of heaven itself. Now, you think that's weird. Read about Scientology, okay? This lady wrote this book, and she grew up in Scientology. I don't know if you saw this in Time Magazine recently. Time or People, I can't remember. But th this girl was raised in Scientology, and she grew up, and she met another guy in Scientology, and they, they both figured out that this, this was goofy. This whole thing's goofy, okay? And the story about this, this guy who's an alien, and he comes to Earth to repopulate the Earth. And their, their whole storyline that they have is right out of a science fiction novel. L. Ron Hubbard was just an amazing guy. He was a, he re, I've seen his videos, man. He's bizarre. But this young lady's uncle is the number one guy in this cult. And her parents gave her up when she was very young. Beautiful girl. Nice, cute little baby they had. And they just give her over to Scientology and say, you raise her. Raised in a gulag out in Montana. You know, they do that. They put them out there and they raise them up and they indoctrinate them and they work them and they make them. They make, it's like white slavery is what it is. And, and child slavery. And, and, and all the things she was saying, and it has this wonderful picture in the article with her and her husband and her two little kids, and she's having this family now that she never had a childhood and she's living out her childhood through these two kids because she never had one. And they literally escaped. And writing the book about it was kind of their protection against the whole organization. Fantastic. I said, man, that's fantastic. 
And I thought about it. I go, you know, we sit right in the middle of this group. They don't have clear water. I remember when they bought the Jack Tar Harrison Hotel in 1969, 68, 69. When we moved here, who bought that? Some cult bought that thing. As I said, my dad said, some cult bought that thing. They're running that cult out of that thing. I said, really? And before you know it, they're everywhere. You don't want to mess with those folks. And yet they want to mess with you. You know, you, you, you listen to all that and read a little bit about all that, and then you look at what we're talking about, and we're going, wow, this is way better. This is not, this is, it is equally as fantastic. But when you believe it and understand it to be the truth, and you know the grace of God in truth, and the Holy Spirit inside of you is teaching and reaffirming these things constantly among ourselves, with ourselves, in ourselves, what happens is you begin to get happy about that, and you get, you get some joy in your life about it. I talked to a guy yesterday, and it was a sad conversation. I've been ministering to this guy for years now, and I, he was talking about all these things that he had gotten, and he finally had everything he wanted. He had gotten to buy all these different things he was wanting. It's all about things, you know. And then, and he says, and it made me happy, and I'm done, and I, I just got it all done, and I'm, I'm done. And he said, I'm going to you know, I'm going to go do something else now. <laughs> I said, okay, you know. And I'm thinking to myself, you really, got, you really got happiness from buying all that junk? You got it in a storage building. That made him happy? He acquired some things that he wanted, and that's all he ever wanted? I was like, are you kidding me? Man, you are missing it. Woo, it's going right over your head because it's not about stuff. You came in naked you're going out naked you brought nothing in you're taking nothing with you what I like about that whole verse is the idea of taking nothing with you I like the idea of going as a matter of fact I try to spend most of my waking hours there now that's where I am so that's where I think and I like to stay there and I don't like it down here quite honestly but I work here, so this is what I do. But as much as I can, I want to share this with other people because it's part of the gospel of the grace of God. It's part of teaching people something that they need to hear. Turn over to Acts chapter 20, and you can see that in Acts chapter 20, Paul is really adamant. I mean, he is absolutely excited about this message. And notice what he says in Acts chapter 20, verse 17. And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, I'm in Acts 20, 17. He says, and when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. The reason he didn't know the things that shall befall me there is he didn't, he wasn't told to go there. Here you have a man who has a commission who is directly acting against his own Savior. The Apostle Paul is wanting to do something of his own accord. He is in rebellion, is what he's doing. Now, he's talking to these men, and he's on his way to Jerusalem, and he's having a council with them. And he says, I do not know, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. He knows the Jews have been chasing him around since he's gotten saved. They took a vow early on to not eat or drink until he's dead. I mean, this was no secret, and now he's going to go down to the hornet's nest, and he's going to try to mess with them. Would you mess with a hornet's nest, knowing what it is? 
I watched my Uncle Bob one time with a bunch of bees, and a whole bunch of bees swarmed out of the end of a, 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 a clothesline pole, you know? They were making a big nest in there, and they came out, and he was out there looking at it. I don't know why he was doing this, but he's messing with it, because I guess his wife wanted him to get rid of them. So all of a sudden, they're swarming everywhere. He goes, get back. So I, I, we all stepped back, and we watched him. He just stood there, and these bees are lighting all over him. You know what happens when you disturb those things? They come out after you. <laughs> They're ready to strike, but they don't, they don't hit you and sting. They all get on you, and then they wait for the signal. And when the signal comes to them, they sting you instantly together. <laughs> That's not a good thing, okay? So he's going down there to mess with these things that are going on down there, and he's not being told to do that. And the Holy Spirit, in verse 23, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. He knows because he's, he is actually going against the will of God the Holy Spirit in this action. And here's what he says about it. He gets quite emotional here. Look at verse 24. But none of these things move me. The actions of the Holy Spirit weren't moving him. And he says, Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. That's not the way to finish your course with joy, Paul. The way you finish your course with joy is do what your Savior tells you to do. We see Paul do so many things right. And yet it's clear from Romans 7 that he struggled just like everybody else with his old nature. In this particular case, he loved his own brethren, the nation of Israel, so much. And these cronies that he was leading the charge for and he was out there as their, as their poster child for being a super guy, you know, he's a superman, he's going to go stamp this cult out, he's going to get rid of this thing for us. And in the midst of all that, he was, I'm sure, being backed by a very, very strong group of supporters. Cronies. Minions. <laughs> whatever you want to call them. But I'm going to tell you something. On his way there, he's being told, he wants them to receive the gospel of the grace of God. He wants them to hear him testify the gospel of the grace of God. And let me share with you what happened when he did that. Here's what he does. He gets a chance to talk to the multitudes. And he's going to defend himself on the steps of a castle, the prison. They've had him in prison, and he's going to get out. He's already sent his nephew to help him escape and bring the Roman soldiers and tell them, hey, they're going to assassinate me on the, on the, on the steps out there when that come out. His nephew's telling him this. That he heard him. The nephew heard him talking about the plot to assassinate him. And so what he does is he tells the nephew to go go to talk to some other people and get the help, and they'll get me out of here. And they did. So now all of a sudden he's wanting to leave real quick. Kind of different than, than, you know, you get down there and they're all over you, stinging you. you yeah, you want to leave, don't you? Well, this wouldn't have happened if you'd been out in the Gentiles doing your work where you should have been. What are you doing down here? He goes through the paces. Look at verse 37 of 21. And as Paul was led into the castle, he said to, unto the chief captain, May I speak unto thee, who said, Canst thou speak Greek? Art thou not that Egyptian, which before these days uh, made us an uproar and led us out into the wilderness, 4,000 men that were murderers? I mean, they, got even, they don't even know who he is. But Paul said, uh, I am a man which am a Jew of Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city. I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. And when he had given him license, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with the hand unto the people. And when there was made a great silence, he spake unto them in the Hebrew tongue, 
saying, Men and brethren and fathers, hear ye my defense, which I make now unto you. And when they had heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept the more silence. And he said, and he goes on, and he starts to recount his testimony. Look at verse 4. He says, And I persecuted this way unto death, he says, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, and also the high priest doth bear me witness and all the estate of the elders, from whom also I received letters unto the brethren and went to Damascus to bring them which were bound, they are bound unto Jerusalem for to be punished. He's telling about this, about his own conversion. If you read down through here, and then he gets into the part that they really can't take. This really gets, this frosts their cupcakes so much. This gets them so angry that they quit, they break the silence, and they want to kill him right there. Here's what he says. And it came to pass, I'm in 2217, and it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance. Now, he's referring back to what happened to him in Acts chapter 9, right after Acts chapter 9, after he got converted. He had came to Jerusalem, okay? This is right after he gets saved. He comes to Jerusalem, and he's in the temple, and he's in a trance, and Jesus Christ tells him to leave and go to the Gentiles way back then. Here he is, many, many, many years later, still going down there. Now look, there's only two groups of people in Jerusalem. There's, there's lost Jews, and there's saved Jews. The saved Jews have a group of people, okay, that minister to them. They're called the little flock. And the lost Jews are lost because they don't want anything to do with this message at all, and God's already told him that many, many years before. And you can read the account of him recording it here. And here's what he says. He was in a trance. Look at verse 18. And I saw him saying unto me, verse 18, Make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem. Notice what he says. For they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. Now how do you think God knew that? Well, he's God. He knows everything. He's sharing, which pathetically having to share it with Paul this information, and it, it doesn't seem to be registering. <laughs> He's not even listening to it. He says, and I said, Lord, they know that I am prison. See, he's making an argument now. He says, Lord, I, <laughs> they know that I am prison and beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. And he said unto me, what? Depart. He heard enough. He's talking back. I mean, the man is talking back in the temple to the Lord Jesus Christ while he's in a trance to him. He's arguing with him. Is that what a commissioner wants to hear when he commissions somebody to go do a job? No. He doesn't say anything else either. Because that's it. He says, depart, for I will send thee far hands to the Gentiles. That's it. He had done this many, many years ago. Paul's recounting this as part of his testimony. He's just telling them what happened. And yet he's down there again. He can't stay away. Let me give you a little bit of insight to that. Look over at what he says in Romans chapter 9. He is zealous. You see how zealous he was as Saul of Tarsus and how much damage he did? You see that personality coming out in him? God turned that around and used that, that zealous attitude. He used that, that, that energy that he had to go out and, and, and do the work of the ministry for him. He tells Ananias, he's a chosen vessel unto me. And Paul is. But boy, you know what? You want a fast horse, you've got to be careful. Because you get on a fast-spirited horse, they'll go sideways with you. They'll run into water deeper than they are high. Because they don't know how, where the bottom is. They'll just jump in. You don't want to be on the back of a horse when he's in there like that. It's a good way to get kicked to death real quick. You don't want to have a horse running through a forest and, and, and you be trying to duck the limbs. Okay? You get on a horse that's highly spirited, and he might get away from you. 
The Apostle Paul didn't get away because God put him in jail. And in Ephesians chapter 3, he says, I'm the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. Yeah, he had his time in life. And he didn't go, he didn't go awry. He didn't go off the reservation. But man, he was spirited and he was a little bit difficult to control. You know why? Here it is. Look at Romans chapter 9. He says, I say the truth in Christ. I'm in verse 1. I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have a great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my, brother, my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Who are Israelites, verse 4. To whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. Who are the fathers and of whom concerning the flesh Christ came who is over all. God bless forever. Amen. But you notice what he's focused on? He's focused on the flesh. He's focused on his flesh, his own flesh and blood. He's focused on his earthly family. He's focused on his nation. He's focused because he sees what they've done, and he was part of it, and now he can't stand it because they, they just won't believe it. It's killing him. And it's killing his ministry, too. You look at the amount of time he wasted because of all this, not good. Now, when you look at this, you have to understand, we fellowship in the gospel of the grace of God. When you go out there in the world system and you meet people, you're going to find people that say they're Christians and they act like they're, <laughs> they're part of Christianity, and you talk to them about the gospel and they no more know Acts 20, 24, they have no idea what's going on with the gospel of the grace of God. The gospel of the grace of God is something we fellowship in together. The clarity of that gospel, the teaching of that gospel, the details of that gospel, the giving out of that gospel to the training of doing that, to the training of teaching it, whatever it takes, we're interested in those things here because that's the focus of what our Savior wants us to do. People don't get saved unless they hear this gospel. The gospel of the grace of God is something that is absolutely, almost completely void out in Christendom today. And if you doubt my word on that, please take six weeks of your life and go visit six or eight, ten, twelve churches. Go to the morning service. Go to the evening service of a different church. You can hit two or three churches in one Sunday. Go out and do it. Go to their midweek classes. Go anywhere you want to go and take your time. And listen to what's going on out there. And you will come back here very, very glad to be home. Am I right? I'm telling you right now. This has nothing to do with Russ. It has nothing to do with anybody in here. It has to do with the message that we preach. You are now sitting in a room that is the official ambassadorship class in this area. That's what we teach. We're ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ. And in that process, go over to Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, in that process of giving out the gospel of grace, the sufferings of Christ begin to come upon us. Philippians chapter 3. Boy, you see, you see what he says in Acts 9 about Paul. He says uh, to Ananias, he says, I'm going to show him how many great things he's going to suffer for my name's sake. Well, is Paul your pattern? Yes, he is. And you're going to do the same. And when you resist that, you're going to do the same thing Paul was doing. You know, you, you, he was doing what he wanted to do his way, but you'll, you'll end up doing the things you want to do your way. It, don't, it doesn't really matter. The, the same thing will occur, and you'll both come back to the same viewpoint. And the viewpoint he has, he says, Woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. You do not want to have this information and be privy to it and then not do anything with it. That's the worst possible thing you could do. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he talked about those people down there in Tyre and Sidon that were not believing his message and were rejecting his ministry and rejecting him, he says, you know, it would have been better for them just not to have been born. Is it not better for people not to be born than to be born and go to the lake of fire? 
I would think so. So for you and I, we have an opportunity to suffer and in two completely different ways. Okay? Look at Philippians chapter 3. You can suffer with him or you can suffer under him. Now, we're not going to suffer in the lake of fire because we're not going to the lake of fire. We're justified before God and we're free from all that. My sin is all gone as we sing. We're done with all that. There is no sin issue here. We have assurance. We have security. We're members of the body of Christ. We fellowship in that. So that means we're, we're in the service now of God. We're stewards, as Paul says, of the mysteries of God. Look at 1 Corinthians. Hold your place in Philippians. And let's start this, this idea with this verse. And then we'll come back and... and, and Take a look at it in, in Philippians. Just let's go over here first and then we'll, we'll move over there. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, he says, verse 1, let a man so account of us, verse 1, as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. If you ask somebody, are you a steward of the mysteries of God? And you say, the mysteries of God? What are you talking about? That's a mystery to me. <laughs> Well, how are you going to be a good steward if you're not acquainted with the mysteries of God? He says in verse 2, moreover, it is required, he says, in stewards, that's a person who takes care of things, overseer, that a man be found what? Faithful. Wow, this is pretty heavy. But there's some suffering that goes with it. Look down at verse 9. He says, For I think that God has set forth us, the apostles, last, as it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world, and to angels, and to men. We talk about Jesus Christ being born to die. Hey, the apostles were born to die too. Paul says, He called me from my mother's womb. What, what's the end result? Death. Do you have any ideas in your life about being executed? I don't think my life's going to end that way, do you? Do you have any ideas like that? I don't think Paul did until he met Jesus Christ. And once he realized what he had given to him, <laughs> he says, they did that to him. What are they going to do to me for talking about it? Don't be scared of death. You've got nothing to be scared of. However, the less you say, the less suffering you'll have. That is a coward's way out. The sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ come with the power to endure those sufferings. Look at verse 10. He says, For we are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. Even unto this present hour we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place and labor working with our own hands. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the offscouring of all things unto this day. I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you, for though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet, ha ye, excuse me, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, he says, I have begotten you through the gospel. That's how it's done. One at a time. Here a little, there a little, like the word. Line upon line, precept upon precept. The more you learn, the better you get trained. The better it is, the easier it is, the more successful it is, and people get saved. He says, wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. He says, for this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son, and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. Now some are puffed up, as though I would not come unto you. But I will come to you shortly, if the Lord will, and will know not the speech of them which are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, 
he says, but in power. He's talking about men's words. He says, what will ye? Shall I come unto you with a rod or in love and in the spirit of meekness? <laughs> wow. He's pouring it on him, isn't he? And you learn, go over to Philippians 3, you learn that these sufferings bring with them a closeness, an intimacy, a fellowship that before you die, you must try this. You must be a part of it. You cannot live your whole life and say, well, I never really took it that far. Now, I, I believed everything, and I, I listened to all that, but this part right here, I'm not interested in that. <laughs> I can see why. I wasn't interested in it either. I kind of worked into it. <laughs> but you know what happened? Like Jeremiah said, the word was in my heart, and it was like a burning, just, it was just like, it was just burning. He says, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't do anything else with it. He says, thy words were found and I did eat them. And when you eat God's word and you take in the bread of life and you eat it, you're going to start talking about it. Nobody's going to stop you from doing so. And you see Paul trying to get to his own people so bad, he was like a runaway horse. Couldn't be stopped. I've been on a runaway horse more than once, and I can tell you, if you start running a horse back towards the barn, he's not going to stop. Except at the end, when he comes to the fence, he'll stop real quick, and you keep going. You can pull until the cows come home on that horse, and he will not be affected by it. Because he knows what's back there. Food, water, and a stall. And that's more important to him than you. <laughs> there's a way to stop him but you got to know how to do it and, and God knew exactly how to do it this relationship that you have with the Lord Jesus Christ and his commission to you is the single most important relationship you have it's number one we have fellowship in this, in the sufferings of Christ, and we have fellowship in the Spirit of God as He lives in us. Look over Philippians chapter 2. When you're thinking about these things, we're just about done. He says in verse 1, Philippians 2, 1, he says, If there be any cons therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love... If any fellowship of the Spirit, you see that? If any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Vanity has no place in the local church. Self-glorification has no place in the local church. Strife has no place in the local church. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. It dawned on me yesterday when I was talking to this young man on the phone why he's so miserable in life. He's been so focused on obtaining these things and this stuff that he hasn't been able to cultivate relationships like he should. And he has no one. And when I deal with him, I love him unconditionally. I, I don't put any restrictions on him or expectations or whatever. We just minister to him, and, and he, he just doesn't understand that this relationship has to be cultivated. It has to be worked on. It has to be cared about. It has to be fostered. It has to be understood that the fellowship of the Spirit and the relationship that you have with the Lord through the Holy Spirit and His teaching to you is absolutely essential for you to grow. Jesus Christ lives in you, Paul says. This is the truth. And the commission that He's given us is very important, and we need to be together on this. We have a new life in Christ. And this new life is not something that we have as lonely people. You're never alone in the body of Christ. Somebody says, how many people are in your church? I said, millions and millions and millions, millions and millions and millions. We're just a little chapter right here in Pinellas Park. But wow, 
We shine brightly as far as the angels are concerned. I think we shine brightly as far as the Lord's concerned because I think it's pretty clear for 25 years we've been sitting in this room preaching this message this way. Now some people say that's not progress. That is what progress is, is standing fast and not moving. Digging in and holding ground because Satan wants to wipe us out. And he's tried many times to do so individually among us. And as far as the group goes, he's tried that too. He's always messing with everybody that preaches this message. And I don't know why he wouldn't. However, there are some advantages here. Let's, let's talk about this for just a second. Go over to Galatians chapter 2. Your message is clear. We don't need to go over that whole thing about that. We, we do it all the time. Your life of service is at stake every day. Because while you want to avoid the sufferings, you avoid the ministry. And when you avoid that, what happens is you go before him at the judgment seat of Christ, and then you suffer loss for running away from the ministry. You won't see anybody matter at Moses in the Bible than God. He was talking this morning, Jason was talking about how Moses was standing, or God was standing up for Moses against Miriam and Aaron. Aaron, yes, he did. But boy, you go back earlier on in there and you read when God starts talking to Moses after he's been in the wilderness for 40 years, hiding on the backside of the desert, he's not real happy with him. He says, take your shoes off, you're on holy ground. Yes, sir. Forty years ago you ran away. Forty years. It's a long time. Puts the guy into service at 80. Everybody around here at 80 wants to go to the you know, time to ready to go to the retirement home. You know, it's time to go retire. <laughs> it's time to do that at 62. Man, forget it. There is no retirement. This, whole, this program we're in has a retirement plan, but it's out of this world. Not in this world. And so when you go there at the judgment seat of Christ, you don't want to suffer loss there. You want to suffer the loss here. You understand? Because here you're just losing something you're going to lose anyway. So just let it go. Life is too short to be hanging on to stuff and worrying about stuff. Paul says in verse 20 of Galatians 2, he says, I am crucified with Christ. And he stood that way. Nevertheless, I live. So what kind of life you got now, Paul? He says, yet not I. <laughs> it's not about me anymore. It was, believe me, it was all about me. And that changed. He says, but Christ liveth in me now. He says, Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Boy, when he wrote this right here, he was clicking on all cylinders. When, he, when Luke records that, what's going on back there in Acts chapter 20 on his way to Jerusalem, Paul's running a rabbit over there. He's running down, he's running down a, the wrong way. He got right back on it real quick real quick and he did most of his best work from a prison cell and Ephesians chapter 3 let's turn over there and close the book Ephesians chapter 3 he starts out by saying this for this cause I Paul the prisoner of Jesus Christ not prisoner of the Gentiles the prisoner of Jesus Christ he says I'm the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Can I tell you that happened to you exactly the same way it happened to him? 
by God's grace, you were given a gift, a new vocation, and, and it's your job to go out and minister to everybody you can. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. The mysteries made up of 12 sub-mysteries, smaller ones, that all point and show the various aspects of the big one. And he says, this thing was hid in God. It was kept a secret. And he says, for the intention is here in verse 10, to the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by us, that's us, the church, the manifold wisdom of God. This is educating angels and men in the dispensation of grace. That's what we're here for. We're not here to change the power structure of planet Earth. We're not here to save the planet. We're not here to do any of those things. We're not going green. We're going red all the way, man. Boom. And those that are left, they're going to go red too. Not going to be good. And until we work on that and until we make that a priority in our life, we're going to watch people die and go to hell in front of us all the time, constantly. Just had two friends from school die and go to hell. And I know that's where they are because I knew both of them, talked to both of them. Didn't want it. Those were some of my early persecutions when I was 17, 18, 19. Just coming into this. First people I talk to, my friends. You don't think your friends make you suffer. Try to tell them about your new life in Jesus Christ and, God, and being in God's family, and they'll laugh at you from one end of the day to the other. They won't listen because they don't want to listen. And when Paul is told that the Jews in Jerusalem are not going to listen, Paul wouldn't believe it. We'll believe it. Doesn't mean you've got to give up on them. But what's going to happen is this. You'll get the call. You'll find out. One day, that person's going to be dead. That person's going to be dead. And all of a sudden, you go, well, I didn't spend enough time investing my time in that person. I didn't call that person enough. I didn't write to that person. I, didn't do, I, I just can't. I fell out of touch with that person, like we do. Well, it's the last time you'll ever see that person. That's it. It's gone. It's over. Eternity is forever. And this message that we have is so valuable that we have to rejoice in it in this new family because of the safety it brings and all these things that go with it. There's true fellowship here. And it's all because of the grace of God. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, and we thank you for the fellowship that we have as we fellowship together as stewards of the mysteries of God. We thank you, Lord, for it, and we thank you for the opportunities that we have from week to week and day to day to talk to people and share this with people, that we shout it, Lord, from every opportunity that we can take and, and, and use to, to help others understand what they're missing. We thank you for it today. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.